Hello, everyone uh, out there in cyberspace. Uh, Morning. <laughs> are we having a good day? Here. Uh, hello. Um, so those of you who uh, I've never met before, uh, my name is Fortune St. Keen. I am from the East Kingdom. Uh, I am, uh, someone described me yesterday uh, or two days ago as, as an OG. SCA courtesan. I don't think I'm an OG SCA courtesan, but um, I've certainly been around since the KWC uh, was was an idea. Um, I uh, I've had an interesting path in the SCA. I've been about 14 years in. I uh, last year was uh, Queen of the East at Penzik. Uh, let me just tell you, the Rose was not a peerage I thought was ever going to. Uh, be a thing for me, uh, but it happened. Uh, I figured I was more on the service and uh, education world track. I love looking into the naughty side of history because I think if you discount um, if you discount sex workers and sort of the naughty side of history, you are discounting. You are whitewashing history. You're not, you're not getting the full picture, shall we say? Uh, I was at a party a couple of years ago, and uh, the partner of a friend of mine, who is a, a Laurel herself, leaned over and she goes, I want you to do a class on the history of kissing. And I don't know if this individual even remembers uh, saying that to me, uh, but I definitely went and researched uh, the history of kissing. Uh, and it's... <laughs> It's interesting. Uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it, we take it for granted because we feel like it is something we've always done. It is not something we've always done. You should probably let her in, right? Um, so I have, Bianca, can you put in the link to the class notes in there? It is in the chat. Perfect. Uh, so there is a, a link uh, to the class notes, which are on my, my blog, which is gildedkisses.com. Um, it was a me to me present for Christmas. I was getting a domain. Uh, so my class notes are always up and available. Um, I very much am against hoarding knowledge. Uh, so if I have information, I am happy to go out and share it with folks um, and let them know what is out there as well. Uh, so in my mundane life, I am a uh, corporate trainer. Uh, so teaching tends to be an interesting uh, sideline that I also do at SA events. Um, so my persona is more of a 1520s, 1530s Venetian courtesan, uh, which if anyone's watched the original Italian Renaissance gateway drug movie, Dangerous Beauty, uh, gets you right in the heart of that. Uh, if you've never watched Dangerous Beauty, you should go and find it. Uh, it was on Netflix for a while. You can get it on Amazon Prime. Go and find it. Excellent movie. It's how a lot of us end up as Venetians. Um, so, kissing is not a universal thing. We didn't we didn't come spring fully formed from the earth, uh, deciding that kissing was a good idea. Actually, anthropologists can't really figure out why we started doing this uh, and why it caught on. Uh, <laughs> so on the one hand, there's a group of anthropologists. This is like anything in academics. Nobody fully agrees. Everyone has a theory. Um, one school of thought is it is instinctual. Uh, <laughs> uh, instinctual, it's intuitive. If it were instinctual and intuitive, then all cultures across the world would have kissing, and that just isn't the case. Uh, in modern Asia, um, 
even into the 90s, you could find articles published in China warning against this Western influence of kissing. Uh, the other group of anth anthropologists believe that it comes from kiss feeding, which is basically where the mother, uh, like a bird, chews up food in her mouth and sticks it into her child's mouth. Um, who knows? Group one is a little more pleasant to think about. Uh, uh, it, but the kiss is definitely uh, in uh, Western culture, it is definitely uh, our big form of emotional currency. Uh, kisses uh, throughout history, though, a lot more are to convey power. Uh, so think of that as you go through this. Uh, the kiss involved a lot of power um, and was not necessarily always romantic. Um, now, granted, we are in the middle of COVID and the coronavirus, and who knows if we'll go about kissing just random strangers or our friends when we see them ever again. I don't know. Hope for, hope for better times and a vaccine. So one of the plausible biological reasons that we kiss is possibly because it allows us to get close to a prospective mate and sort of test the air for their pheromones and their saliva. Now, granted, whether or not pheromones are really a thing, that's another thing that scientists are, are conflicted about, um, but um, they have done studies of things like women are given uh, t-shirts that gentlemen have uh, worn for a week and they are supposed to rate the attractiveness based on the smell of the t-shirt. Uh, and it tends to, they, they have found that people tend to uh, find the sweat of the person who is most biologically diverse from them uh, most attractive because we are not but animals, really, in the grand scheme of things. Um, it takes a lot of muscle coordination to kiss. Uh, this is one of those, like, cliched, happy thoughts, calendar things. It's like, you know, it takes less muscles to smile than it takes to frown. Well, it takes 34 facial muscles and 112 postural muscles to kiss properly. So, and if you would like to add this to your workout routine, if you're one of those people who like myself has discovered cooking uh, in this time of self-isolation and perhaps the COVID-15 is a thing, uh, kissing does burn 26 calories a minute. So if you have sheltered in with someone else of a romantic nature, uh, this, is, this is your chance to get a workout in, perhaps later this afternoon. I often get asked if there is a lab portion to this, qu this class. This is the lecture portion. Uh, I usually tell people the lab portion is after dark, once the torches have come out. Unfortunately, none of us are at Penzik. So if you have found that individual, you have potted together with someone, please enjoy the lab portion later. Uh, average person will spend 20,160 minutes uh, kissing in their lifetime, which is about two weeks. I challenge you to try to make it three for your life. It is a highly pleasant activity, and you should do it. Uh, there are a bunch of illustrations in period. I have some in the handout. Uh, Roman de la Rose, circa 1390, has kissing. Um, it is uh, an interesting, an interesting always to see it in period and what people are doing. Um, so where does the word come from? Uh, this is one of those. Uh, her described as English is what happens when Norman, uh, Norman foot soldiers try to get it on with Anglo-Saxon barmaids. Uh, but it does come from the Old English, kissen, to kiss, and cos is kiss. Lip-to-lip uh, -lip kissing is called osculation specifically. Of course, we have to be very scientific about this and get the exact terms for each type of kiss. Um, there are 20 words in French for kissing. There are 30 words in German, which God bless the Germans. 
uh, they're a precise people. I have recently started relearning uh, German vocabulary on uh, Duolingo, and I am always surprised at how specific we get in terms for things. Um, so there are German words including Nachkuss, uh, which is making up for kisses that have not been given, which sounds delightfully pleasant. And hopefully we will all engage in when we can see one another again. Um, so the earliest records we have of kissing are going to come from India. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, the Indian subcontinent was ahead of its time. There's so many of the pleasant things that we like to engage in. Uh, so 1500 BCE, the Vedic Sanskrit texts, uh, which of course are the, the basis of the Hindu religion. Um, there is uh, no mention of the word kiss, but there are descriptions that get real close to kissing, which is something you're gonna see throughout history. Um, ancient history is we're gonna get real close to talking about kissing or what is very clearly probably kissing. We don't have a word for it. Um, one of the things I have been doing in this uh, time of isolation is going through a book uh, called The History of Sex by Kate Lister uh, and reading out chapters um, with a book club. Uh, one of those chapters was on the history of the clitoris. So the clitoris doesn't get its name until way far into history, uh, almost into the 1800s. Um, it does get discovered a variety of times, including twice in the same decade in the mid 1500s in Italy. Um, and every time it's man, and every time he's just astonished that no one else knew where it was. Like, knew where it was that time. Um, so, Indian um, script, uh, Sanskrit texts talk about kissing. Um, specifically, they talk about licking. This is going to come up a lot, the licking. Uh, drinking the moisture of the lips is going to happen. Uh, both lip and tongue kissing are mentioned in Sumerian myths. If you have never read ancient Sumerian myths, and I know that sounds super dry and super boring, there is some raunchy stuff in there. Um, there are there are references to the princely cream getting spread on things. Uh, there, there are some interesting texts in there. Uh, definitely want to look into the Sanskrit. Uh, so uh, the Sumerian myth from a tablet found near Nippur, uh, so 2600 to 300 BCE, uh, is about the birth and the conception of the moon god Sin. Uh, the goddess Nilil speaks, resisting Enlil. Uh, there's a lot of resisting, so trigger warning in that. Um, you know, my lips are too small. They know not to kiss. My precious sweet, lying by my heart, one by one, tongue making, one by one. When my sweet precious, my heart, has lain down to each of them in turn, kissing with the tongue, each in turn. So another thing you'll find out with the Sumerian text is there's a lot of repeating. Um, so with cream, with cream, with princely cream. So each in turn. So we have, clearly there is some allusion there uh, to kissing. Uh, I'm gonna butcher any Indian or Sanskrit words that I use. I apologize now, uh, straight off. <laughs> So affectionate mouth-to-mouth -mouth kissing was also in the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, Mahabharata, fourth century BCE. Um, so they have this tradition of affection. If you have never read the original uh, translations of the Kama Sutra, so we're all familiar sort of with the Kama Sutra as having sex positions. People are less familiar that it really is a guidebook on um, intimate relations with a partner. So there's a lot of talk about kissing. There's a lot of talk about different archetypes, um, how those different archetypes will work together. Um, there used to uh, Lalita Dasa, who is a lady out of uh, now on tier when she would come to Penzik, had an excellent class on the Kama Sutra. 
uh, and the different art pieces there. Uh, but the third century AD is when the Vatsadayana Kama Sutra, we know it as the Kama Sutra, because of course, once the Western world develop, discovers something, almost magically, it's all our idea, um, including an entire chapter discussing how to kiss. Um, so there are four methods of kissing. So we have moderate, contracted, pressed, and soft, uh, as well as three types of kisses uh, by a young woman. So we have the nominal kiss, uh, which is the girl touches her lips with her lover, but, but she doesn't do anything. So you're just touching by the lips, the nominal kiss. Uh, we have a throbbing kiss. Um, so the female here, the, the woman here would set aside her bashfulness, responds with the lower but not the upper lip, which not exactly sure how that works, but would like to take it into the lab portion so we can do some experimentation. And then we have the touching kiss, which I really love the description of, um, which is the girl touches her lover's lips with her tongue, closes her eyes, and lays her hands on her lover's hands. Um, one of the things you will get from the Kama Sutra is that foreplay is important. Uh, if, only, if only the Western world could develop uh, some sort of understanding of that. Uh, so yes. Go and read the chapter on kissing in the Kama Sutra. It's a great time. We also have kissing like an Egyptian. So let's go to ancient Egypt, um, where we have all sorts of surviving poetry. Thank them. Um, so kissing is described in some of their love poetry of the New Kingdom. So that's 1540 to 1087 BCE. Uh, found on a papyri excavated at Deir el Medina. Uh, and we have The Wine of Love. So generally, these poems did not come with a title. They tend to be named after a uh, theme or the first line. But The Wine of Love. So, oh, when my lady comes and I with love behold her, I take her into my beating heart and in my arms enfold her. My heart is filled with joy divine, for I am hers and she is mine. Oh, when her soft embrace do give my love completeness, the perfumes of Arabia anoint me with their sweetness. And when her lips are pressed to mine, I am made drunk and need not wine. When we kiss and her warm lips half open, I flowed cloud high without beer. What paradise gained, what fulfillment, what a heavenly turn of affairs. Oh, raise one to men cat, our lady of liquor, but keep your mouth on the girl. Uh, so, bless the Egyptians. They come up with some great descriptions of things, uh, including getting drunk off, off someone's lips. Uh, Plutarch's Lives also depicts Cleopatra uh, dreaming about her first kiss with Mark Antony and plotting her seduction from there. Uh, so we have the ancient world, we have uh, kissing in India. It seems uh, from history that Alexander the Great, so Alexander the Great, one of his great campaigns, uh, was to get to India. He was hoping to invade India. Um, didn't quite ever achieve it, um, but they got close enough, um, conquered the Punjab region of India in 326 BCE, and kissing starts to spread back to the Western world. Um, the Romans are thought to have spread the habit. So, you know, thank the Romans. We got aqueducts, we got roads, and we got kissing uh, to most of Europe and North Africa from the Romans. Uh, the Romans, in fact, in their writings, could not shut up about kissing. They are constantly talking about it. But the Romans are also going to use this as power. Um, it is going to very much uh, delineate power moves uh, and structures for kissing. It is not specifically um, just for romantic uses. Uh, they had words for different kinds of kisses because, of course, we have to be precise. Um, 
-hmm. So kissing on the hand or the cheek is called an osculum. Uh, kissing on the lips with the mouth closed was called a bossium, uh, which is used between re relatives. And then, of course, there's the kiss of passion, which is the suavium, which I think is a delightful word, and we need to use it more. So, suavium. All right. Um, Roman couples would announce their intention to wed by kissing on the mouth to mouth in front of their families. So congratulations if you would like to announce your betrothal. Apparently making out in front of your family while in Roman garb is traditional. Um, have at it. I'd love to see it. Uh, Lucretius describes, uh, he's a poet, he describes what we would probably call French kissing. Again, they don't have words for it. Uh, it's a lot of kissing and sucking at the mouth. Um, in his De Rerum Natura, quote, they grip, they squeeze, and with humid tongues, nobody wants your tongue described as humid, by the way, with humid tongues they dart, as each would force their way to the other's heart. So. Perhaps not the romant most romantic way to describe that, but uh, it worked for them. Ovid, uh, God, Ovid. Oh, Ovid. Ovid and Catalyst are also going to talk about romantic kissing in their poetry as well, but kissing is still not a worldwide phenomenon at this point. Uh, the majority of the world does not kiss until it comes in contact with Europeans. Uh, we talked about uh, Asian countries uh, as, as late as the 90s, uh, warning against this Western influence. So it is interesting, oh, we always have to look at things um, sort of through our own cultural bias. I think we're, we're very good at this. Uh, we get better at this the more we study in the SCA of like, oh, I would always expect this to have gone this way. <laughs> yes, but apart from that, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> Romans go home. <laughs> Absolute favorite Monty Python movie, uh, Life of Brian. Highly recommend. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> uh, it is a strange imported practice, this kissing, in many places. Um, but we will find that the more it spreads, like it gets picked up pretty quickly once people are like, you do what with your mouth? Well, I... I'll allow it, we can try that, I guess. All right, uh, so we have <laughs> uh, the Bible. So, one of my household was raised uh, without religion uh, by her parents, and I always have to remember that I'm coming from this from a, a Protestant raised uh, background. Uh, so a lot of the Catholic traditions, I'm sort of like, well, that's real weird. <laughs> and she's like, well, that's real weird to everything. So we're going through a Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and we're going through the uh, medieval wing of art, and we're looking at all the different paintings and artifacts, and she's like, okay, well, what is this from? Okay, well, that's a story in the Bible. Well, what is this from? That's, that's a story in the Bible. Well, what's this from? It's a story in the Bible. And we get out of that wing and she goes, you know, they needed a second book. They did need a second book. Um, but I have gotten much more familiar with my biblical history, looking at art history and, and finding all these obscure little vignettes. Um, but they definitely needed a second book. But even with the one book, it's still going to talk about kissing. Because we all know the raunchiest section of the Bible, which is, of course, Song of Solomon. And the Psalms. Solomon and the Psalms. They are, uh, th there's some stuff in there that gets real into stuff. So we have uh, romantic kissing that is mentioned in the thank you, links to the Bibli. Uh, so Song of Solomon, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. So again, this drunkenness, this uh, chemical euphoria that kissing releases uh, was very well known uh, by our ancestors. 
uh, and they were just as pleased with it as we were in most cases. Um, the first, however, the Bible is more going to talk about kisses of obedience. So we talked before about uh, kisses relating to power. Um, so the first mention of kisses in the Bible comes from Genesis. Genesis is the first book. Uh, Jacob uh, deceptively kisses his blind and ailing father Isaac while dressed as his twin brother Esau, stealing Isaac's blessing along with the power to rule. Uh, so we have kisses of obedience of a son to father. You're also going to see kisses between uh, political um, political groups uh, throughout this. Uh, and his father Isaac said unto him, come near now and kiss me, my son. So that's Genesis chapter 27, verse 26. I do not know what version of the Bible that is from. I apologize. I should know better to put that in here. Because again, all of this is subject to interpretation. So when Moses goes to meet his father-in-law, so Moses is left Egypt. Um, he goes to see his father-in-law and he did ob ob obeisance, obeisance and kissed him. And they kissed each other of their welfare. They asked each other of their welfare. <laughs> uh, and they came into the tent. So again, you are showing respect to a father figure uh, with these kisses of obedience. Um, Judas. So Judas is famously the apostle who betrayed Jesus uh, to the Romans. Uh, he gave Jesus a kiss, a sign of obedience. Still betrayed him. Um, and the sign of obedience and seen as kissing the ring is seen throughout period and today, even close to today uh, in the Catholic Church. You would kiss the ring of a bishop or a cardinal or the Pope. High clergy in the Catholic Church. Uh, the Pope, of course, you kiss his toe because uh, the more power someone has in relation to you, uh, the lower down you're going to be kissing them. Take that as you will. Um, so there are also kisses that are expressions of profound gratitude found in the Bible. Uh, Paul takes his leave. Uh, the elders of a congregation at Ephesus. And uh, they all wept sore and fell upon Paul's neck and kissed him. And that's Acts 20, 37. Uh, so our ancestors were not as shy about kissing <laughs> yep uh, our ancestors were not shy about kissing each other uh, hello goodbye I think in uh, those of us in the US see that as a very European thing uh, but uh, it is definitely a very old and ancient practice greetings so kisses as greetings go back to the Babylonians so the Babylonians have a creation story known as the Enuma, uh, the Enuma Elish. It's recorded on stone tablets in 7th century BC, and it talk, again talks about kisses of greeting and kisses of supplication. So uh, the ancient Persians also kissed hello and goodbye. Uh, God love them. In Syrophadia, three, uh, 370 BCE, uh, Xenophon wrote about the Persian custom of kissing upon the lips upon departure uh, while talking about the departure of Cyrus the Great as a boy from his Median kinsman. Herodotus also records that the Persian men of equal rank uh, greet each other with kisses on the lips while a lower rank is going to kiss the cheek. So again, these are kisses of power. You are showing your obedience uh, and the power to the other person. The Odyssey, nope, nope. Herodotus, Herodotus also reports the Egyptians could not keep, kiss Greeks on the mouth uh, because they ate their sacred animal, the cacao. Uh, fascinating, all these different customs that come from us. Uh, the Odyssey mentions Odysseus's faithful shepherds kissing him in greeting when he finally got home. Uh, if you're familiar with the Odyssey, the Odyssey 
Uh, Odysseus goes on a, quite the adventure, uh, gets very lost, fails to ask for directions, uh, but does eventually return home years and years and years later. Again, the ancient Romans are going to kiss in greeting. So again, this is very common in the ancient world. And again, it's going to be based on your social status. Uh, if you can kiss various body, body parts from the cheek all the way down to the foot. <laughs> again, the lower body part that you're kissing, the higher rank of the person. So we saw this before with the Pope, where you may kiss the Pope's toe. Uh, you may kiss the feet of someone who is very much high ranking, much more high ranking than you are. Uh, the Ethiopian kings were kissed on the foot, and the Midian kings were considered too supreme to be kissed at all. So again, we have to get to Africa here, uh, and kissing has spread there as well. So kissing also gets uh, very much tied up in breath. Um, and so we have to look at ancient customs relating to uh, the breath of life. Um, and we get into also some air kisses that come through uh, sort of middle period, middle of our period. Um, so kisses as an expression of very deep emotion, again, appear in the Bible with Joseph. Not familiar with Joseph's story? I highly recommend Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Donny Osmond. It is on many streaming services near you. Um, but he goes in Genesis and kisses his father's dead body, his father's Israel. Um, Islamic lore talks about Abu Bakr, um, which is Muhammad's first disciple, father-in-law and successor, that when the prophet passes away, he went into Muhammad's tent, uh, uncovered his face and kissed him. Right. So we are also seeing this uh, not just in uh, the Bible, but also in Islamic texts. We're also going to be mentioning kissing. But again, not always romantic kissing. Kissing has a wide variety of purposes. Um, it was there is an ancient belief that kisses to the dead would follow uh, you into the underworld. Uh, so there is a history of kissing folks who have passed away. Um, so that love and that support and those kisses would follow them in death. Which is kind of sweet. Apart from that kissing dead bodies part. So again, throughout the Middle Ages, the kisses are going to stand in, um, are going to be a demonstration of your social standing. Um, the Romans come up with ideas, we keep them. God love us. Uh, king subjects are again going to kiss the ring. They're going to kiss his robe, hands, uh, the ground before them. Uh, the kiss also serves as a sign of trust between feudal lords and their vassals. Sue doesn't love the feudal system. Uh, knights kissed at jousting tournaments and would receive one from the person they protected as thanks for a year of service. I would love to have us uh, bring back kissing at tournaments. I think that'd be a great idea. Again, once we're done with the coronavirus and God help us, I want us to be done with the coronavirus. I would love to see a crown tournament. Uh, where the entrants would kiss each other, right? During early Middle Ages, literacy was rare. Uh, a kiss was actually used as a legal way to sign contracts and seal contracts. Sealed with a kiss, shall we say. Uh, you drew an X on the line and you kissed it to make it legal. So this is one of the theories as to why we write X's and O's for hugs and kisses at the end of letters. Um, so. Again, love to see this as contracts. Sign your ex, kiss it. Um, <laughs> other uh, religious rituals, uh, blowing a kiss. 
uh, was a ritual in ancient Mesopotamia where you're asking for the gods for a favor. So you are sending that kiss up to the gods with whatever favor it is that you're looking to have uh, fulfilled. Uh, the Hindu kiss, uh, the Hindu kiss the ground of the temple to indicate that it is sacred and it is pure. Uh, the Jewish kiss, kiss the wailing wall uh, during prayer and the Torah. Uh, it has been very interesting throughout um, the, the different measures that have had to be taken uh, due to COVID. Um, that there are different ways that they are uh, protecting um, from these rituals that still take place where people are putting their mouths on things. Um, and you will even see this in period, some of the religious um, traditions with the kiss of peace. So the Christians have, they share the kiss of peace, the osculum passis. It's a greeting for early Christians. It's believed to carry the soul of the kisser into the other, connecting them spiritually with each other. It is so important that the Bible mentions the holy kiss of peace five times. Five. Five holy kisses. Um, so Romans, Corinthians 1, Corinthians 2, 1 Thess Thessalonians, Peter first, uh, first Peter. Greet one with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. So you will notice very quickly, we are doing the kiss of peace. And very quickly went, aha, we have miscalculated. Uh, we have said everyone can do this. And that is leading to some shenanigans. Um, and then greet one another with a holy kiss of love. Um, early congregations very quickly get segregated uh, by the sexes. Uh, so lest this holy ritual uh, take on a more carnal twist, which once again, Christianity leads us to having spoil sports. How dare they? Um, but yes, they very quickly discovered, oh shoot, this kiss of peace thing. The entire, the entire congregation is making out. We should probably do something about this. We are unlike those horrible Romans. Uh, who would do such a thing. It is believed in the 13th century, the Franciscans. Ah, uh, the Franciscans. Let's talk about Francis and the things that he's done. He is, he is a joy killer, if ever there was one. Um, the Franciscans, instead of kissing each other, they came up with this board called the Pax Board. Um, where you kissed the board and the board got passed around instead of each other. Um, <laughs> you can actually still find kissing boards um, in some of the very old cathedrals. Uh, they're out there. They've been worn away. Uh, Protestants, un very unsurprisingly for Protestants, uh, believe that this is absolutely unacceptable. They're against kissing, removed all kissing from all worship ceremonies, is disgusting, carnal act, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Go and think about what you've done somewhere where it's uncomfortable and cold. I remember that I am uh, in the beautiful Shire of Quintavia, just outside of uh, nearby Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, the Puritans have come here, and oh, believe me, their touch is still felt throughout these beautiful lands. Uh, should be ashamed, very much ashamed all your wanton acts. Um, kissing icons was a common practice. It's still practiced today. Uh, we are very lucky uh, near where I live. We have a museum in Clinton, Massachusetts that is dedicated to Russian icons. Uh, and you can actually see the spaces on icons where they have been kissed. Uh, it gets worn away on the icon itself. Uh, often images of the saints and their relics themselves were kissed and many account that these kisses cured the sick of what ailed them. Um, definitely uh, the Roman, uh, the, not the Roman, the, the medieval Catholic practices uh, dealing with saints and different, um, different uh, items that they would bring. So if you look at, I, I love the art of um, 
who I have no words today. There are some sort of late 1400s art that is very mm -hmm. dimensional in Italy. Um, and it is because and it's a lot of sort of dimensional gold. And it's because the actual figural items out of metal would have been nailed to these items, to these uh, images. Crivelli, Carlo Crivelli. There mm -hmm. we go. Carlo Crivelli's work. Uh, highly dimensional, um, very interesting. Um, he, uh, if you look at his work, that work was, they had to pull all of these icons and things that had been nailed to those paintings off before they could be restored. Um, it was very common, especially in, in Italy, that you would, you know, you're having an issue with a foot, you would get a gold foot or a tin foot, you would nail it to the painting and hope the saint would cure you from whatever that is. Um, so fascinating, fascinating practices. Um, so uh, there are many accounts um, throughout history of people saying, you know, oh, I kissed the, the painting of the saint and I'm cured. So it is until the Middle Ages where the romance returns to the kiss. Um, it becomes romantic again around the Middle Ages in the West. Again, we're going to be very clear this is Western Europe. Um, some point around the late 11th century, early 12th century, uh, the lip kiss starts surfacing again in stories. So the Dark Ages, also dark because uh, they are not mentioning kisses. Give me just one second. There, we'll turn off Facebook Messenger so it stops making ding ding noises. All right, uh, so the Dark Ages are also dark because of the lack of any real evidence of kissing happening during them. So once Rome falls, uh, we really don't have much of a record of kissing um, until we get to the Middle Ages. Um, so stories about kissing lip to lip start to surface in stories again, in legends and popular writing. References to romantic kissing uh, seem to disappear during those dark ages between the fall of Rome and sort of early 12th century. Um, replaced uh, by kissing as both a greeting and an indicator of status. Again, a lot of kissing in period has to do with power. We don't know why the romantic kiss sort of disappears from the historic record. Um, some people talk about, oh, they were discouraging women's sexuality. Uh, I'm not super thrilled with that theory. Um, Marcel Danesi in the history of, of the kiss. Uh, Danesi also proposes um, the kiss has a significant role in romantic choice. And if marriages during this time, and again, unfortunately, we don't keep a record of what is happening on the everyday level for the everyday person. We usually only keep a track of what is happening to the nobility, to the royalty. Um, we don't know what is happening sort of on the day-to-day -day level for kissing, um, but romantic uh, kissing seems to come back as a way to indicate um, your romantic choice in a partner. Um, so you are sort of the way kissing comes back in the middle ages the more passionate the kiss the way so it's sort of the more passionate the kiss the less likely you should be kissing that person okay it always comes up when you are kissing the wrong person the wrong choice um you know the I'm betrothed to someone, but I can't resist you. You know, that sort of thing. Um, anyone has, I'm going to mention this later, but Eloise and Abelard. Uh, if you've ever read the letters that still survive between Eloise and Abelard, that is one of the things they talk about is very passionate romantic kisses, and they should not have been making out at all for multitude of reasons. Um, but uh, 
romantic choice starts to um, seems to be involved there. Once kissing comes back, though, it very quickly becomes all the rage. Um, Dutch philosopher uh, Erasmus travels to England in 1499 and writes about kissing as an unstoppable fashion. And he relays this back. The English girls are divinely pretty and they have one custom which cannot be too much admired. When you go anywhere on a visit, the girls kiss you. They kiss you when you arrive, they kiss you when you go away, and they kiss you when you return. Once you have tasted how soft and fragrant those lips are, you could spend your life there. Uh, so very much comes back as a, you know, hey, we're not doing this at home. Maybe we could pick up this custom. I'm very fond of this custom here. Uh, also 16th century Tunisian Sheikh uh, Umar Ibn Muhammad al Nafwazi has wrote a book called The Perfumed Garden. And he explains that a kiss on the mouth and on the two cheeks and upon the neck are the gifts of God, which I cannot disagree with. Neck kisses are definitely the gifts of God. So medieval kissing by the book. So when it comes back to the um, written record, because again, we have to go up by the written record on this. The kiss again, when it's showing up in medieval literature, it's showing passion uh, and relationships which were outside of the norm. Uh, secret lovers are constantly kissing in defiance of their family, of culture, of whatever it is they are kissing. Uh, courtly love again is gonna take this a step further. We're gonna show power in kissing. Um, that it can make two people fall in love. Uh, Di Amore, The Art of Courtly Love by Andreas Capelan Capelanus in 1185, lists all the principles of chival chivalric code. Chivalric code, um, if you've ever gone and read it, is some interesting stuff. And it includes, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. <laughs> No one can be bound by a double love, and he who is not jealous cannot love. So there is some toxic, toxic monogamy culture right there. <laughs> well, if you're not jealous, you don't really love that person. That's not going to help anyone's state of mind. Um, but you can see where those ideas come from. We carry those, the, the remnants of those ideas even now in our culture in Brazil, relation to kissing. Um, kisses, the lip kisses of the Chivalric Code are pure love. Right. Uh, the troubadours of Southern France talk about it in love songs. They spread the idea of romantic love and kissing in their works in the 12th and 13th century. So come let us kiss, dear lover, you and I, within the meads where pretty songbirds fly. We will do all despite the jealous eye. Ah, God, oh, ah, God, the dawn, it comes how soon. Um, let us go out in the meadows and spend all night kissing. It's thrilling. And even go to like Romeo and Juliet. It's the nightingale and not the lark. It's not morning yet. It's not morning. We can still kiss. Still make out all night. Ah, uh, Eloise and Abelard. Star-crossed lovers, if there ever were any. Uh, definitely go. Their letters are available online. Uh, go and read them. Eloise and Abelard. Let's see. Do I discuss really how they... Nope, I don't discuss them. We'll talk about them here. Eloise. Uh, extremely bright young woman. Uh, noble woman. Uh, she is living in the house of her uncle. Her uncle is paying for her to be educated. She has a tutor. Your tutor is Abelard. Abelard uh, proceeds to, through a series of just never giving up, uh, convince her to uh, fall in love with him. And uh, he waits for her in the garden. He jumps out of the bushes and kisses her. He just, he is not giving up. 
and she is like, I am studying. I, I can't do this. I'm too pure a young woman. And he wears down those defenses. Her uncle does not like that they have ended up in a romantic relationship. Um, and he goes ahead and hires thugs to go find Abelard and castrate him. And Abelard then goes off and becomes a monk. Eloise gives birth to their child, whose name is something ridiculous like Astrolabe. Um, she goes off and gives out birth to a child out of Ledlock and then becomes an abbess. Um, and then later on in life, the two of them correspond sort of about what might have been back in the day. Um, so Abelard ta talks in his correspondence with her that he dreamed of kissing her long before he did and how these kisses inflamed him. He could hardly keep to his bed. Uh, it is very much a great passion. It is defying the rules of that time of polite society. Abelard also talks about how he plotted to kiss her. Give me just one moment. There we go. Now we don't have to hear the little dog. He plotted to kiss her while she was walking with her sister in the garden. Again, jumps out of the bushes. Uh, very slapstick. Uh, it is the most, like, uh, I accidentally jumped out of the bushes and I was too nervous and our lips collided and I felt really good about that, but I don't think it was really a kiss. Oh, Abelard. Oh, Abelard. Um, he also talks about her chastely kissing the hands of her tutor. Uh, revealing her exalted soul. Uh, and again, it is directly in contrast to the violent kisses that he thinks about in his, uh, in his dreams about her and their nighttime rendezvous. Um, but yes, you can go and read. <laughs> uh, you can definitely go and read her. Uh, their, their correspondence is still out there. And then sometime... I want to say it was in the 1800s that somebody actually, like the time of Napoleon, they actually found both of their graves and they are now buried together. And it's all very romantic. And that he used a position of power to probably seduce her. But you know, whatever. Different times. Uh, so we have Eloise and Abelard, definitely star-crossed lovers, should not have been together. Uh, Chaucer also talks about in the Miller's Tale, misdirected kisses. Again, the kisses that you would give your spouse are not nearly as exciting as the kisses you would get from your illicit lover, who may or may not be visiting through the window. Um, and uh, Chaucer, uh, very classy individual, in the middle of this also makes a fart joke. Um, Why nay, quote he. God would, my sweet leaf, I am thine Absalon, my dearling of gold, <laughs> quote he. I have brought a ring, my mother yaffeth me, so God save me save, full fine it is, and there will ye grave, and I will give it to thee if you will give me a kiss. So I'm going to give you my gold ring if you will but kiss me out this window. Um, and... Uh, Instead, the miller's wife uh, proceeds to have the lover that she already has in the house uh, fart out the window in Absalon's face. Yeah, that's a thing that happens. Again, just because some, some work of uh, fiction is old does not mean it is boring. You definitely want to check out uh, Chaucer's got some naughty, naughty stuff in there. <laughs> Uh, All the world's a stage. So we have Commedia dell'arte uh, emerges in the 15th century. Uh, stock characters. Um, if you've ever had a chance to watch the Commedia dell'arte performances um, at Penzic or locally, if you have a Commedia dell'arte troupe in your kingdom, definitely go and watch them. They're hilarious. It is basically the world's first improv. They have a basic idea. Um, 
that's delightful. But the stock characters, um, so in Italy, women actually played the women's parts. In England, men played the women's parts. Um, uh, but they have stock characters, so you know the characters before they come up on the stage and sort of what their motivations are in Commedia. Uh, you have two old men, four uh, innamorati, two male, two female lovers, uh, two zany, a captain and a servetta, a serving maid. Um, and there was often kissing and illicit lovers. And, and again, kisses get real, real, real passionate with the illicit lovers, far more than they do than somebody you were meant to actually be married to. Bianca, my darling, am I over time? Or did I ask for an hour and a half? You asked for an hour and a half. Oh, I am so wise. I am so <laughs> wise. There we go. So Romeo and Juliet, we talked about Shakespeare talking about kisses and courtship. Of course, his most famous romantic play. Um, Romeo and Juliet, I, I do not find it romantic. They are two teenagers who should not have been allowed to get married. And they lead to a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> Romeo starts that play off hopelessly in love with someone else who thankfully escapes his, his amorous intentions. Um, but in As You Like It, Rosalind, as Ganymede, instructs Orlando on how to woo. The lesson begins. He says he would like to kiss her before speaking. She suggests that maybe that's not, that's, that's a real bold move and maybe we don't start off the bat with that. Um, save his kiss for a moment when the conversation lags. Uh, Orlando worries what he's gonna do if she says no to kissing. Um, and Rosalind reassures them that if, if she says no, that's only gonna give him, quote, new matter to discuss with his lover. Well, why don't you want to kiss me? Just sounds delightful. Um, Romeo and Juliet, again, the, the absolute prime example of illicit love leading to massive amounts of passion and then it burns itself out very quickly. Um, the romance begins and ends with kisses. They first meet when he, Romeo, invades the ball. And he touches her hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in a dialogue laced with religious metaphors, uh, that Juliet is a saint and Romeo is a pilgrim who wishes to erase his sin. So palm to palm is Holy Palmer's kiss. Um, he tries to convince her to kiss him. She says no. Um, and, it, and, this kid, and then he eventually woos her over and she takes the sin from him in that kiss. In this ridiculous religious sort of foreplay weird move. Sort of like, well, we can't do this, but maybe if we pretend it's all about religion, we can. Mm, okay. Um, and she has taken Romeo's sin from him. His sin must now reside in her lips. So they have to kiss again. And at the very end, Romeo drinks the poison, kisses Juliet's prone body, and thus, with a kiss, I die. So they start out their romantic courtship with a kiss. And they end it. Literally end it all. Um, yes. Not my favorite romantic Shakespeare. My favorite would, of course, be um, Much Ado About Nothing, which is far funnier. All right. So, kissing gets banned. A couple times throughout period, kissing gets banned. Despite really not knowing about germs and how germs spread, uh, they still kind of figured out certain things. So Emperor Tiberius bans kissing from AD 14 to 37 in public, in public ceremonies. People point to this as the first sort of mention of perhaps herpes. Um, there was definitely some sort of infection that was spreading. Uh, they called it a fungoid disease. They called it mentagra. Inflamed the hair follicles, which disfigured the faces and bodies of noble Romans. Because again, Romans are kissing to show obedience and to show power. And male politicians are going to kiss on the lips uh, to greet one another. And in Rome, in a culture where um, beauty is seen uh, as being showing that you have the favor of the gods. 
Uh, so has anyone, I'm sure you haven't, you've never seen Miss Fisher Mysteries, uh, the main character is named Phryne Fisher. Goes back to a classical story about Phryne, who was a, um, I believe she was a prostitute. Yeah, she is on trial for something. Can't remember all the details at the moment. I apologize. Uh, she is on trial for something, and to prove her innocence to the judge, she whips out her tits <laughs> and is like, "If I were not given the favor of the gods, why would I have these?" And that's her entire argument. Uh, I am so beautiful, I can't have done anything wrong. The gods must favor me. Uh, so this disease that is disfiguring the faces of Romans uh, must be stopped because then these politicians are going to be seen as not having the favor of the gods. They're going to lose their power. Um, so for these years, uh, kissing was banned between um, officials. Again, some articles are described as herpes. It is definitely some sort of contagion. And they knew enough that these kisses were spreading it. Uh, Shakespeare also is thought to have mentioned herpes in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, or ladies' lips, who straight on kisses dream, which oft the angry Mab with blisters plagues. So they definitely knew there was some sort of sore upon the lips that was spread from kissing. Uh, kissing again gets banned. Uh, this time it is in uh, Italy, I believe. No, excuse me, England. Uh, July 16th, 1439, fear of the blank, Black Death. Uh, there's no explanation for the cause. We don't know what it is. Um, there is some suspicion that somehow people are spreading it. Um, so we are going to through their saliva, so we are going to, um, Henry the Sixth is going to ban kissing through Parliament, um, ending the ceremony of knights kissing the king on the mouth uh, when they did him a service. So, and uh, he went all out, he banned all kissing. I'm sure that didn't actually stop things, but at least it slowed the spread. The hope that quote, small specks, quote, of plague could be kept from spreading. So again, they didn't know what it was, but they had some thoughts and they, they weren't stupid. Our ancestors weren't dumb. They just didn't have all the knowledge we have. Um, so they uh, get real close to figuring out what is going on uh, and they make some decisions. Um, this is believed to be when kisses on the mouth start to move to the cheek. Because um, again, they believe it has something to do with saliva, uh, so they're going to ban the mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. Um, in 1562, Naples, Italy banned kissing in public, hoping again to stop another outbreak of the plague. Uh, those caught kissing could be sentenced to death. So just don't kiss in public. Kiss behind closed doors. All right. So yes, it does get banned throughout history. It never lasts too long, um, but it is always because of there's some sort of spread of disease. It is never more, more um, sort of uh, Puritan ideals. It is always, it's not like this is dirty, it's just that it might actually be dirty. <laughs> um, so kissing as part of the marriage ceremony. So we talked about the Protestants. Uh, the Protestants are against kissing the kiss of peace. Uh, the Catholics have the kissing board, for the kiss of peace. Uh, but both Catholic and Protestant marriage ceremonies allowed for what they called breath kisses. <laughs> um, uh, breath kisses are part of the marriage ceremony. So you are going to commingle your breath. And in that way, because in your breath is your soul, you're going to commingle your souls as well. Um, so your lips don't actually touch. So you may now breath kiss the bride and just sort of huff on each other. And doesn't that just sound awful? <laughs> in an era with very little dental uh, standards, 
and different hygiene standards. That just does not sound pleasant in the least. But again, we can all try it out. Um, the ancient Celtic love rituals also used a breath kiss. Again, you're exchanging the breath of life as your part of courtship. Um, and again, putting the ring on your betrothed finger is thought to uh, imitate intercourse. So God love the marriage ceremony as far as we think we have come from these uh, more pagan roots. We haven't come that far at all. Um, the idea of the kiss containing your breath or soul is also seen in the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, the where the princess is woken with a kiss. It is true love's kiss. He, he is able, through the power of his soul, purify hers and wake her up. Right. Ah, yes. Kissing games. Cloven fruit. Who's familiar with cloven fruit? Yes? No? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the books I have for this is called The History of the Kiss by Marcel Danesi, uh, who relates the game of cloven fruit, specifically an apple with cloves. I've usually heard it described or seen it as an orange, usually a clementine with cloves, uh, is true history from 16th century England. Uh, this is uh, not the case. This is true SEA history from the barony of Carolinja. Uh, which is the Boston area. It is one of those things that we have brought here. Uh, the cloven fruit is a is an almost holy um, uh, SCA tradition. I don't mean holy as in religiously. I mean W H O L Y L E Y holy, almost completely SCA tradition. Uh, so kissing games, not a thing, not a thing. Because again, if you're sharing kisses, they're usually illicit. So you should not be doing them. Yeah. Uh, and thankfully the tradition of the cloven fruit in the SCA has mostly died out um, because that game does not take consent into account whatsoever. <laughs> um, and generally uh, terrified newcomers uh, who did not want to kiss some weirdo who came up to them with a fruit. So yes, let's also talk about kissing under the mistletoe. Kissing under the mistletoe, despite being widely reported as being something that is medieval, is not. Um, the romantic overtones likely started with the Druids about first century AD. Mistletoe could even blossom in the frozen winter, so it was thought to be a sacred symbol of vitality. Uh, and the Druids and the Greeks administered it to people and animals alike in hopes of restoring fertility. When the first Christians came to Western Europe, some tried to ban the use of mistletoe as a decoration in churches. Many churches continued to display the mistletoe. Um, in York, uh, the York minister, uh, the York Cathedral brings in a bow of mistletoe on their high altar in a tradition dating back to the Middle Ages. They still do this. Um, they have a special mistletoe ceremony. Uh, um, and it is supposed to pardon all the wrongdoers in the city of York. Uh, so again, as far as we think we've gotten from our, our pagan roots, they, they still crop up throughout Christianity. Um, they also still bless the animals in York, which I think is adorable. I was reading the article about this. Um, so other famous mistletoe folklore comes from Norse mythology. Odin's son Balder was prophesied to die. His mother Frigg, the goddess of love, went to all the animals and plants of the natural world to secure an oath that they would not harm him. Uh, but she forgot to talk to the mistletoe. And Loki made an arrow from mistletoe and, and saw that it was used to kill the otherwise invincible Balder. According to one of the sunnier versions of the myth, the gods were able to resurrect him from the dead and delighted Frigg declared that mistletoe was a symbol of love and vowed to plant a kiss on all those who passed beneath it. Uh, mistletoe's association with fertility and vitality continue throughout the Middle Ages. But the 18th century is really when we get kissing bows. Um, so it isn't until uh, late 1700s 
uh, 1800s that we get kissing bows um, and balls uh, associated with Christmas time festivity festivities and having that over a doorway and kissing. Um, first, it seems to have caught on among servants in England and then it spread to the middle class and then of course the nobility took it over and of course it was their idea from there on out. Um, so when you, uh, the original custom was you would kiss underneath the bow of mistletoe and you would take a berry uh, each time. Uh, when all the berries were gone, you had to stop kissing. All right. So I hate to break it to anyone who was uh, thrilled about the romantic mistletoe kisses, but those are not in period. Kissing the hand. One of the very first classes I took in the SCA at Penzik uh, was with uh, a gentleman, um, Tempus, who teaches about how to kiss hands. Uh, so we talk about that. Um, it does seem to have originated with the Islamic Caliphate in the seventh century. Um, and again, the Roman Catholic Church, Catholic uh, meeting with the Pope or the Cardinal, or even a lower ranking sort of prelate uh, would kiss the ring on their hand. Uh, hand kissing became quite popular in England during the Industrial Revolution. Some say it evolved into the handshake, some say it didn't. Um, but it was considered a respectful way for a gentleman to greet a lady. Um, seems to have shown up in the Polish or Lithuanian areas uh, in the Spanish courts in the 17th and 18th century. Um, and there are places that still do greetings by kissing the hand. Traditionally, the hand kiss is going to be initiated by a woman. So you're going to hold out your hand uh, to be kissed. Um, the lady offering her hand is expected to be the same or higher social status than the man. Uh, it's all about power. Kisses are all about power. Um, it is a, uh, a gesture of courtesy and extreme politeness. Uh, it is considered impolite or even rude to re refuse an offered hand. Um, and it is quite uncommon. Largely, it's been replaced by kisses on the cheek or handshakes. Um, but it definitely was a fixture in the early SCA experience that I had. I was offering her hand to be kissed. And sometimes the gentleman would take it and just sort of like touch the forehead to it. Um, so yes, we have come to the end of the history of kissing. Uh, does anyone have any questions now that I have talked for an hour and a half? Or an hour and 15? An hour and 15? Yes, go ahead. Fair enough. Go okay, ahead. I don't know if this was raised while I was off answering at the door. But in reading up on English country dances, I found that England was long regarded as the kissingest country. We read the memoirs of continental bachelors who wanted to die and go to England. Yes. Because there, yes. <laughs> because there it was good manners to greet all women with a kiss. Yeah, no, that is definitely, that is definitely a thing. Uh, the English were very much considered... Uh, uh, the kissing bandits, basically, of uh, period, um, which is sort of an interesting uh, dichotomy, because we always think of them as the stuffy sort of individuals, but uh, kissing was definitely a thing uh, that England was known for, um, and yes, there were people who were, you know, one could just spend your life in England, they just, everyone kisses, this is great, um, but yeah, definitely, that was they definitely seem to have been very up on the kissing traditions. It sort of gave them, I think, uh, a way culturally where you're so bound up otherwise by rules and structures, it gave you uh, sort of a release valve. All right, there's another hand up, it looks like. Yep, or Tassim, go ahead. Um, you mentioned the book, A History of Sex, and I was trying to find it, but there are a number of books with similar titles. Kate Lister. Kate Lister is the author. It came out this spring. Yeah, I, I saw it listed among the several I found. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yep. So I did mention the author there as well. Um, she she has uh, runs the uh, whores of your uh, Twitter account. She's also on Instagram. She is a uh, sex prof sex focused professor in Leeds, England. Uh, she put out this book. I, mine happened to come right before the pandemic. Uh, so uh, and for a little while it was hard to get international mail. Uh, so I was reading it out uh, as part of a book club. Um, but yeah, she has, uh, absolutely delightful writing style, highly recommend the book, um, goes over a lot of different courses in history, areas of history, um, and has sort of a nuanced approach of what we, and she always is backing things up with, you know, this study says this, this study says this, and lots of footnotes. Love that book. Highly recommend. You can get it on Kindle as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'll sit here and enjoy my lunch. Um, you mentioned uh, the the kissing games of SCA culture. Mm. <laughs> um, what what was that all ab all about? Was it just misguided? understanding of history or was it it was kind of understanding of history and you have to remember the founders are all of the SCA were all college age um the SCA comes to the east coast because one of the original members starts going to grad school um so we were a much younger society then um and there are were different um cultural mores i think we, you can still see some of the, the young influence of the founders in our sort of uh, love affair with binge drinking culture. <laughs> and they were probably um, a bit idealistic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Idealistic. And, um, Since I know you know, we have, we have different, we have, as much as we don't have as different, we definitely have different ideas about consent and things now. Um, and, yeah, it was just, it was a different time. And no. it was this sort of thing where you would come up and you would approach somebody with a cloven fruit. And uh, it uh, obligated you to kiss that person somewhere. And there was sort of no way for you to back out. And a lot of the history that was uh, available back then was seen through the Victorian eyes as well. It was very, the very romanticized. Yeah. And you know, we are extremely lucky, you know, I will sit there, I will go out to dinner with my parents, and, you know, my father will ask a question, I'll look it up on Wikipedia, and he is continually, continually surprised, like, well, you just looked that up right on your phone, I was like, yeah, I was like, we would have had to go to an encyclopedia, and go to the library, and use the card catalog, and da da da, -da, -da. so we are spoiled right now with information at our fingertips, and just wasn't the case, and, um, you can even see this throughout period where sometimes things, um, one of my favorite uh, illustrations of clothing is from a castle in Trento, Italy, which has an Italian style gown from about the 1510s that is absolutely covered in slashes. And what you can find out is the family that owned that palace had ties to the Austrian court. Um, and came home and they had asked for a depiction of someone from the Austrian court to be put in this fresco on the wall. And they sort of described what the, the Austrians and the Germans were wearing, which was, you know, their clothing and it's all covered in slashes. And so the painter went sort of, okay, sure. And created this, this dress that probably never actually existed um, through this sort of hilarious game of, telephone or you can look at um cesare uh vicellio's uh art of the world where he um was commissioned to uh put together a book of different prints of outfits from around the world and the stuff that is closer to him he gets more right but then sort of goes off on uh an extreme tangent, and there are some woodcuts in there describing or engravings in there uh, showing the Queen of Florida 
uh, who is wearing this ridiculous fern headdress and leaves in just a outfit that makes no sense. <laughs> Absolutely no sense. Um, but sort of you get this game of telephone of like someone's trying to describe what they may or may not have seen or they heard or their brother's third cousin, college roommate twice removed, saw once because he was there, man. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's always interesting when you go through uh, history and you always have to sort of read and then think about what that person's motivations were and what their cultural experiences were. Um, but yeah, thankfully we don't do the cloven spirit thing anymore. Thank the gods. Well, they were still doing it when I first joined the SCA a couple decades ago. And uh, you would put it under your neck and then pass it to someone else under the, you know, under the chin and the neck. And some men would sort of intentionally drop it into someone's cleavage and uh, try to rescue it, which was not pleasant necessarily. No, nope. consent's very important. So one of the things the known world courtesans have, have definitely, uh, I feel, improved in the SCA experience is I feel like we are re-educating everyone about consent and what consent is and, and how you obtain it and why it is so important. Um. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's not fun unless everyone's having fun and active consent, getting someone to say, yes, this is what I want to do. Because no, you know, not saying no is not yes. <laughs> not saying no means you need to ask. And you need to make sure you get a yes. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there are different variations of it. There are different variations of how it was played. But thankfully, it, is, it has gone by the wayside. Um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, say uh, much like we think we're going to have to re-examine how we all greet each other once we're done with this isolation. Things change. The world changes. Any other questions? I think we've got three minutes left. Yep, just about. That was very informative. I enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> well, Bianca, I could have done that for you, you know. <laughs> Any old day, I know. <laughs> All right, Bianca, we're driving to an event. The time has come. <laughs> we're going to learn about kissing today. Yes, who those are not aware of, Bianca, who is acting as moderator today, uh, and I are in the same household in the East. Uh, you're welcome. I'm always happy to teach. Um, it is uh, something I do again mundanely and I enjoy doing uh, in the SCA as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome all. Have a great afternoon. Bye everyone. Go find someone to do lab portion with. <laughs> Safely. Safely. <laughs> in your own pod, please. In your own pod. <laughs>